Oh. Is she dead? No. Hello spirits, I'm not going to go on an exclamation or set up Megamind 2 because this is one of the best films I've ever seen in 2024. Best show as well. Unlike the other films and shows I've reviewed like Dig Man, The Nine Rounds and The Monkey King, nothing could compare to the spectacular event that Megamind and the show could have been. Cause this is just awful. Got you in the first half right? I meant to name this video Sequel Misunderstanding but I noticed it was April Fools coming up, it felt fitting since I wanted to do one of those things. Anyways, Megamind 2 isn't great despite what I just said. Like the fact that it's got Velma rating numbers, it just speaks volumes of what direction not to take an IP. But anyways, yeah, I'm gonna be talking about Megamind 2 and I'm going to keep talking about it because if I've learned anything from the Nine Realms, it comes back, regardless of its numbers. So expect Season 2 within the year. But I do want to say I was initially excited because the Megamind TV show had been pushed back a year, or technically two. Only it was because the film was being made alongside it. Anyways, without further ado, Megamind 2 Sequel Masterpiece. Before I begin, this is how the video will be structured. I'm talking about both the show and film, and I'll show the level of impact it had on the following events. But I'll also use examples from the film Puss in Boots 2, like what I did for Velma, because The Last Witch demonstrates everything that the Megamind 2 movie did, but did it good. Alright, now. The animation in this show is so abysmal, especially when it's considered a sequel movie. However, it is clear that it is a TV movie because it never got a theatrical release. And quite frankly, everything if not most things that are dumped onto Peacock aren't worth the money. This is for you. A McDonald's apple pie? Yeah, yeah, I was saving it, but uh, it's all yours. I've had it in the freezer for two months, so it's probably cooled off by now. Then again, this is also Peacock, who are responsible for hosting another sequel series on their website. To get this out of the way, I do not blame the animators or voice actors for any of the shows, including the Nine Realms. Especially now knowing these are most likely outsourced animators, while the animation isn't as good as the original movie, that would be fine because it's essentially a TV movie. But how is it the writers, creator, or studio funding it can't keep the show or film afloat regardless of its animation quality. At that point, why the fuck are you making it? And I don't know if it's the writers doing when you have the original creators that worked on all eight episodes and the film. Okay, okay, slow your roll, angry spirit. So as it turns out, I mix up with developing and writing. Fucking blame IMDB for being annoying with this shit. From what I can gather, the original creators wrote the second and finale episode, and by no means is it well written. And I'm also not sure of the difference between a staff and normal writer. The rest of the credits are as followed. JD Reisner wrote episodes 1 and 7. Busted. <gasps> Hi Busted, me behemoth. Eric Fogel wrote episode 3. just in the nick of time. You see what I did there? Because we just- Eric Acosta wrote episode four and six. I don't think we did that much damage. <laughs> and Annabelle Seymour wrote episode five. <laughs> Camp Frog Ear! Camp Frog Ear! If we could be stay all year! And I'm pretty sure it's either the writers doing or the directors since all of them have never touched anything related to Megamind. Here's a little fun fact. Weirdly enough, three of them have worked on Carmen Sandiego and Kit First Cat, but two of them have worked on either one or both of those and Escape from Planet Earth. Seriously, what are the chances of that? Or it could just be DreamWorks, because how hard is it to make a film that replicates the same energy the original had, but told to add more? As their past shows demonstrate, that it didn't matter how ugly their shows look, because their writing usually made up for it. And as you watch my video, you'll see why it doesn't feel like the creators wrote it at all. But here's the thing, also. When you're making a popular sequel as cheap as possible, 
people brush the nine realms off because at that point the fans have gotten three films, three shows, multiple shorts, etc., and featured characters you'd think are knockoffs. However, Mega Mind only got a short, three games no one talks about from 12 years ago, and that's it. Meanwhile, Mega Mind fans are very starved for any kind of content, and if you feed hungry sharks with something they don't like, oh my god, you're done. Do you think this day would ever come? <laughs> no way. Not at all, sir. Never. Never in a million. I mean, yes, I did. And there's sometimes a somewhat good chance other movies could get revised, such as the Puss in Boots sequel 11 years later. And speaking as a has been a Mega Mind fan, I had to wait five years for the show and got something made with passion. While Mega Mind fans like myself and my entire family had to wait double that time and got this. Because I initially thought the hate mob for the Nine Realms was decently big, but. It was nothing compared to Mega Mind 2 because unless you were reviewing the show or telling a friend about it, the show really just went under the radar. I've seen memes, videos, comments, tweets of Mega Mind fans just agreeing that the new stuff is just garbage. Even replying to videos that came out 12 years ago to show how bad it is. And trust me when I said that the uproar is absolutely deserved. Was there some kind of battle? Just a dance one. Can you turn off the music please? What music? Oh, that can't be good. When sequels add new characters to spice up that dynamic, it can really go in two ways. An unnecessary addition that offers nothing, or a likeable, well-rounded character that deserves their place in the world. Toy Story 4 had the addition of three new characters, and yet, if you remove them all from the plot, that actually have no weight to it. <laughs> no, really. Rewatch the film and think really hard if these guys have any purpose that isn't for a specific scene or two. Tell me where their presence on screen was necessary. Good work! How'd you get it? How do we get that key? But a good example of this was on Toy Story 4, hey. which had the introduction of Jesse and Bullseye, who were the moral conflict between Woody staying or leaving them, with a backstory for one that's sad in a way to further keep the main character drawn to them. But seriously, that's how you keep a character confined to one area, not, not making a character a plot device. Shrek 2 introduced Puss in Boots who had parts in the film that neither Donkey or Shrek would have had a chance to do. He also in addition spiced up the dynamic and produced some really good humour. Oh, it's kind of a long story, but see, Shrek and I took some magic potion, and well, now we're sexy. Shrek? For you, baby, I could be. And speaking of Puss and Boots, in The Last Wish, Perito was a character that was a key part to not just the main characters but to most of the characters. Perito has everything he wants and doesn't wish for anything more. Jack has everything but wants more. Perino was an orphan just like Goldie, and to bring up the scene again, but he helped push through a panic attack, a motivation that was set up prior in the film. However, Megamind 2 just added the character for the sake of adding them. Seriously, the only ties in terms of character she has is to Megamind, and even then it's just half ass. Keiko would not work in the continuity of Megamind because Megamind's timeline seemed to have somehow shot 10 years into the future, or well, they explicitly mentioned two days had only passed. If you didn't know, Megamind was clearly shown to be in an era where it predates a lot of the modern technology you'd be used to. Yeah, Megamind had flying robots, holographic disguise watches, and literal guns that can create heroes, but it never used or had to mention smartphones, streaming, or explain how the fucking internet works. Because it was never important to the plot. What they did have was flip phones, which really make the film appear in a different time era and isolated from references that just destroyed other films. And I love how the show's meta views on streaming really just predated already, considering the purgatory hell streaming is in, due to their own greed in what, four years since becoming mainstream? And in the film, she's exactly what you'd expect. She knows about technology, streaming, has half a million subscribers, and she's supposed to be a character you're supposed to feel sympathetic for because she was a bad kid when she, uh... Never mentioned that beforehand. Oh, and funny enough, she never brings this up in the TV show again, and she only appeared in the film when she was needed for the plot to continue. In the show, she's not any better. Because get this, it's never once said or even implied that Keiko had moved to the city and struggled to find friends. Considering her first appearance has her talking to her biggest idols after being inspired by them. And yeah, that could just be a mask, but 
In an example like Hasbun Hotel, Master uses symbolism how a character is either the same or hiding their feelings. And in the show, it's hinted multiple times of how this character thinks of himself that he's going through more than what he was letting on. But Keiko just brings this up in a moment of weakness by Megamind while never having set it up prior. Puss in Boots came out only a year after Megamind and its sequel came out 11 years later and was stuck in development hell with confirmed scripts only to have it rewritten and so on. And the director, Joel Crawford, wanted the story to be much more dark than the Shrek franchise had before, as well as having edgier humour. As you can see with some stuff with Burrito. Knuckle, dragging, honey, scrounging, drop, open, munching, binging, nugget, and your snooter. <laughs> But with the opening, and this is the best part, he didn't want the viewers to be reintroduced to Puss, rather where he is now. And I really just love that because it's been more than a decade since we've seen this character on the big screen. We don't need to be revisited to who he is because with this opening, it's telling to who he is. He's an outlaw hero among the people, has a sword, dances and fights monsters. Also their definition of modern technology is leeches, so at least they understand their fucking time period. While for Megamind, they just use clips from the original film and splice it together. The first 10 minutes of The Last Wish shows us the character, the world, and the main story. What's Megamind Rider's excuse? And Keiko is a character you're supposed to like off the bat because of her charismatic and go-to personality. And yet, I didn't get that connection. Perito, on the other hand... Okay, but on a serious note, I can't put my finger on it, but the way she moves her mouth is just so... alien. It's definitely the animation, but it's just so much worse on her. But the best part about her is that we never got a good enough time to really develop her character and show why we'd give a rat's ass about her. Because after her first appearance, she takes an entire 19 minutes to come back into the screen. And then after that less than two minutes of her little appearance, she takes another 15 minutes to go back in. And then finally, in total of roughly 50 minutes into the film, that she finally starts sticking with at least one of the main characters. Which at that point, she's left with what? 20, 30 minutes? Who I shit you not, after minutes, she then explains her backstory and at that point, who fucking cares? We're an hour into the film and there's been no hints that she's going through anything. Because I do get the sentiment with the character and looking past the cheapness of the film, she's supposed to be a character that's been inspired by Megamind to be different than how others expected her to be. Just like Megamind who has grown up in a prison as a villain and found his true calling as a hero. And that she wants to be a hero but Megamind refuses. It's a whole thing I'll get into but that doesn't work and falls apart if your character doesn't have any sort of setup to a backstory or has screen time to demonstrate any sort of dynamic chemistry or connection. Because she just gets pushed into the iconic characters and said, good luck boss salute. Unlike Megamind, Minion and Roxene who didn't need an elaborate backstory because they already knew each other and their dynamic show and they've done this for years. A way I would have worked Keiko into the story is doing an opening cutaway to the battle against Megamind and Titan, which apparently is where she's inspired by. Where it shows Keiko are leaving her apartment and walking to the fight with Titan. But on the way, it shows how No Kid greets her and whispers within their groups showing her issues but talking about it before we even know her. This gives us clips from the original film while focusing on a new character before she introduces herself to Roxanne, who she's seen as a fan rather than someone shoving a camera in your face. Before showing Megamind, she has a fan base she's created since that fight, amassing that a lot of citizens believe in him. And when she tells him about how he can get more attention from all around the help with even just a photo, where he brushes it off until he sees how much people have been changing, and after that I'm not sure what more to take it in. But the opening to her character should have been further explored, because to bring in Perito again, he doesn't have some setup to his character. He is a dog that just so happens to be in the same house Puss is staying in. And through the film, he shows how he's different from characters you think alike, and yet that perspective works. Because when he brings up how he got his sweater, he was deluded into thinking he was hide and seek while being thrown in a river. While Puss and Kitty know what it actually is, And this perspective of character allows Puss to calm down during a panic attack and then talks with someone who provides a fresh view of the relationship. And now Pareto is one of the most favorite characters in the Puss and Boots films. Seriously, have you guys seen all that deaf Pareto and Puss art back when the film hit? That shit was adorable. 
But when I see Keiko, I just think if it's legal to beat kids. Keiko's character stands from an issue of introducing someone hip and fresh. I'm not saying you can't have any sort of modern references in a film, but does it come off as cheesy? Very. But how Megamind 2 does it is just so much worse. For starters, as I've explained with Keiko, she explains how the internet works to Megamind and Minion. Only after they make a reference to the 6 o'clock news. It must have aired on the 6 o'clock news. <laughs> oh, you're serious. Uh, I'm actually gonna ask this. Have you ever heard of the internet? Yes, I've heard of the internet. I'm just not interested. Hey, uh, writers? One of your main characters was a news reporter. The villain from the first film was her cameraman. I'll just show the scene. With the internet and social media, you can put out a story and send it anywhere and to everyone instantly. They call this going viral. I went viral on Metrocity once. Gave everyone dance fever. They act like the internet hasn't been a thing for 20 fucking years, including multiple generations of internet humor, videos, and how it's morphed since its first arrived, while at the same time thinking it's been such a big thing in their world. In that case, welcome to the information age. You're about 30 years late. And that's the thing, you do not need to explain how the internet works to a bunch of kids, or rather everyone that should have been catered to, as teens and adults are most likely going to watch a sequel to a beloved DreamWorks film. Because the entire reason these people are seeing this film and show isn't in a theater, but on a device. They're using the internet! Just a concept, boys, but have you ever considered using your brains? Hey! But if you think that's bad, then you haven't seen anything yet, because episode 1 just has Minion taking a backseat because he's watching old memes. Have you seen this unusual fellow who sings about rage? <laughs> new meme! Uh, how many views? Oh, false alarm, it's just an old one with new words. <laughs> it's like all new memes, but with that special homemade flavor. I think, at least, they mention a cartoon baby dancing, and I'm, I'm guessing it's this. That meme is older than my teacher, and she knits. But not only did they decide to add one character associated with the internet, but instead two. While he only made one appearance, his hero name is Dude Monkey. And as bad as that name sounds, his design is only worse. And I'll leave it up to you whether I mean the suit or his face. But Dude Monkey is what's set up as an inspired hero from Megamind, while all he does is make fun of him. And the main gimmick is that he fights the same villain and Funny enough, I couldn't tell if it was the budget that was cheap, or if it was a coincidence two masked robbers were who he stopped. But no, apparently it's one guy and it's a part of a skit slash fake way to get attention. But through that entire first episode, it doubles back as Megamind learning about the internet. You gonna let him steal meatsicle cut? Nah! Crime stopping rock! Now folks, just call me Dead-Eyed Blue, because when I take my shot at baddies, I never miss. Backslash rash. And, as I just explained for, that's it. I can't even give them credit for figuring out Fright Night's plan because, I mean... Enhance audio. My darkly dark plan to steal the diamond-encrusted koi during the reopening ceremony will be a drowning success. <laughs> Okay, I'm convinced. The Mwahaha did it for me. And at that point, why are you even watch- why, why, why are we watching this episode? Oh, that's just lazy writing. Oh, it's really simple because one of the movie villains steals a diamond fish. Only, wow, he actually steals some random starfish with limb properties with no build up to it. I'll get to that much later, but I feel like that episode should have been making fun of tropes because it looks like they would, but don't. I mean, listen to the theme song for Dude Monkey. I'm gonna dance all over this picture of Megamind until Emilio eyeballs are on this stream! Banana Lama Ding Dong! Ooh, ooh, ah, ooh, ooh, ah. <laughs> oh my god. You know what the best part about this, what, streaming arc? Is that they basically spent eight episodes of Megamind building out some level of an audience, only for that title to be taken away by some villain that I'll get to. Literally eight episodes amounted to next to nothing, and I wouldn't put it past the show to reveal the villain and say he's evil as an ending. Or apparently they're somehow going to work in Metro Man into the next season, and god, I can't wait for this to be a tragedy. Like, the only way they save him is bringing in Brad Pitt or Markiplier, that, that's all I'm saying. Hello 
everybody. My name is Markiplier. In the first film, it was really fun seeing characters both good and bad clash, but it was fun seeing how it was just an act. It felt like one big play, but in the show, it's like they grabbed the pen and just skew their dynamics so far to tell a different story in the worst way possible. For starters, we all remember Minion, right? We love Chum! Wait, who's Chum? Yeah, so I wanted to get this one out of the way because they erased Minion's name. In the first six minutes of the film, Minion is pointed out by the Go Fish Gang, dumb name, in which he corrects him, saying he goes by Chum because that's what Megamind calls him. And it's because of a cease and desist letter, which would all be well and good considering it would be a legal issue, while at the same time you'd say you want those people to fuck right off. Well, that's only if the legality wasn't in universe and wasn't used as a running gag in the show and film. They replaced his name for a bad joke. Meat sickles. You get it? it? It's meat on a stick. Laugh. You can't make this up. And I'd be fine with a name change if they gave him development on how he needs a proper name, not a title. Focusing on him in the sequel film because he's the other part of the Megamind film that made Megamind. Okay, seriously, at this point, Puss in Boots 2 is just scarily a mirror of Megamind 2, but if it was good. Because I just remembered how a character, a part of the trio, had to get a name change. Perito. Throughout the film, Perito was just called Perito, meaning puppy in Spanish, and sometimes I think Puss calls him Dog and Perro during the film. But the thing about the movie is that they don't focus on his name because it's not that important. I mean, considering they're in a forest that can change the entire environment with a single person's touch, a deaf embodiment wolf, and two other antagonists, I don't think it takes priority. So instead, after the ordeal, they sit down and watch the stars and decide on Perito's name, which he suggests is just Perito. And it doesn't feel like a cheap cop-out because it's a name that fits within the group, that being Puss, Kitty and Perito. It's the name that fits because he's fluent in Spanish, has more pizzazz than just Dog and Perro, or the other names they listed. What about Chiquito? <gasps> Chomper! What do you think, Perito? Chomper, no? I got it, I got it. How about Jeff? And it's short, simple, and we've heard the name Perito throughout the entire film. However, Megamind 2 has ample room because they spread the plot so thin with useless crap that they could have done the same with Minion. Or not. S seriously, who decided it was time for a fucking name change? The entire fanbase would like to have a word with you. And speaking of, but do you know how Megamind and Minion made up after the first film? Oh, don't get used to it because Megamind apparently treats him like a pushover. Again. Deal with this for me! In which Minion then goes off to help others. And when I mean others, I mean one person. And when I mean one person, I mean he fixes up a broken diner turned donut shop. And when I mean donut shop, I mean a plot that doesn't add up to anything in the film's continuity. No, seriously, Minion is kicked to the sideline to a majority of the film because he fixes up some diner which is only used as a plot point in the show. Oh yeah, no, that diner that he fixed up surely must have been really important, right? A new base, some mystery? It was used in one episode and it was because Megamind thought the owner would turn evil after accidentally having him in sticky icing. Dr. Donut, everyone! That entire episode constantly has to remind its viewers that that's how arch enemies are created. In which Rox samples a meta joke out of her ass saying this. He's right, Roxy. A hero accidentally creating a nemesis by causing them to fall into something is a well-known villain trope going back to the 50s. Name one example where someone literally created a nemesis by knocking them into something. Got it. Top 10 times where someone literally created a nemesis by knocking them into something. Ugh, the internet's the worst. Roxanne! You're going to break it! Oh no! I can't tell, did anyone actually work on the original film or not? But back into the whole being kicked from the film thing, Megamind and Minion were a fun duo because they'd always been friends since he was an infant and people say Megamind is in his 30s. Meaning that's around 20, maybe 30 years of friendship. And the only time we ever saw them fight was in the film where Megamind changed his route of villainy where Megamind stayed away from villainy because of some girl that in the end will backfire on him, 
and did backfire on him. He leaves him and goes off, and until Megamind goes to prison, Minion was only seen once in the film, which is during Titan's reign over the city. But that's understandable because him leaving had an impact on Megamind. He lost his only friend who's been there through him with every moment. But two days later, it's like he's stepping on him for absolutely no reason and has no emotional connection to it. When Mega Man 1, the thing he learned and realizes is that he treated his best friend Minion like dirt. That is an actual quote from the first film. Created a hero who's turned out to be a villain. I lied to Roxanne and my best friend Minion. I treated like dirt. And Minion helps him because he's crucial to tricking the film's villain Titan at the time as he's disguised himself as Megamind, while Megamind was disguised as Metro Man. And what more do we do with his character? Well, in the second film, he's apparently delegated as the actual Minion rather than a sidekick, which what he was in the first film. Alright then, that that's fine. Still, at least he'll be- he's not important to the story for 50 minutes after he leaves, because Minion rejoins the crew a near hour into the film. Oh yeah, and that donut shop still doesn't get anywhere. Something in The Last Wish is that Puss and Kitty had split off some time before the events of the film, while the remainder they were on film. Puss? Kitty? Puss? Kitty? Santa Coloma is mentioned multiple times before it's revealed why. Kitty and Puss were meant to be married, but he didn't have the guts to go through with it, and supposedly leaving her at the altar. But Kitty says she never went because she would never compete with his ego, a massive part of the reason he's lost eight of his nine lives in the film. They never have to show they spent a long time together when they could rather say it, and show the effects it had on how they act towards each other in the film. Minion splits off screen and doesn't actually have any weight to it because, in truth, they would have been together after 30 minutes, only because of his new boss, Mr. Donut, that prevents that little moment. They reunite after like, 10 minutes and act no different. So who really cares at that point? Either, I keep saying it, but it, the, I think something that they basically erased for a cheap cop-out plot was the spark between Roxanne and Megamind. Because I loved this relationship back then. It was probably one of the first ships I shipped as a kid. How they played off one another before Megamind was revealed as Bernard dating Roxanne, only to hurt Roxanne because of everything he's done. Only to get saved by Megamind and Minion, with her helping the public realize who helped them by revealing him herself after he gave her his hand. But in the film and show, it's just awkward. They act like they're old friends and that's it. They don't even bother continuing the love they had for each other. Oh no, correction, they never mention it or bring it up until Megamind spends an entire episode being, being jealous. jealous. Alright, I'm all for Roxanne and Megamind, but it's the fact that they didn't even continue, mention, or even hint of what their relationship they had. It's just forgotten. I'd explain their dynamic in the film and show, but Roxanne is just the voice of reason for both Minion and Megamind in both the TV show and film. What I might as well bring up now is randomly a mayor. Mayor Roxanne Ritchie. I like the sound of that. Huh. That's just lazy writing. Because the other one who looked like he aged 30 years in two days, hid. And her only other purpose in the film is to be like this bestie for Keiko. You guys having a little trouble? How are you always around? Us girls gotta have our secrets, am I right? How did you two find me anyway? Us girls gotta have our secrets. Touche. It's touche. Speaking of Mega Mind, oh my god, he has been nerfed so badly. Because in order to save the city, he uses different sorts of gadgets that either don't work, uncreative, and much more. And while at least they watched the button of doom which demonstrated he didn't need to be Metro Man for the city, but he could use his own inventions for the city. Maybe you should stop trying to be him and just be you. Really? Is that possible? B but I sold all my evil stuff. Well... There's not even a mention of Spider-Bot, who was the entire reason they were alive. And the reason Spider-Bot was there was because Minion kept him secretly, but instead of focusing on working inventions, they decide he shouldn't use any technology. I wish I was kidding, yet yeah, yeah, so Megamind doesn't actually have any inventions besides the Portal Bazooka, Dehydration Gun, he uses it on some stock villains called the Go Fish Gang, but not the Doom Syndicate. Megamind Towers, but feel free to enjoy the show. Get him! <laughs> and the sequel is Laser Cage that malfunctions. Twice. 
leaving him to buy and use supplies from some everything store to destroy a group of villains. Remember those tennis ball launchers in the trailer? Yeah, they are. They use that. And okay, seriously, Puss in Boots, The Last Wish is like the perfect comparison. So this is where dignity goes to die. Because Puss lost his sword. Puss's sword is as iconic as himself. It's the blade he uses any time he needs to fight or be smug about himself. But in the film, after he fights death, he ditches it and is left with a stick and Kitty's small dagger for the remainder. It's not until the end scene with Death does he get it back because Death has been carrying it with him until that moment. And then the emotional moment about him realising he has to cherish and celebrate his one life because it makes it special, before getting his groove back back on with the fight. That's how you take away a character's main weapon and bringing it back for the final showdown. They're not taking his tech away, using crap to build more crap, and then somehow making that crap to actually work. Because even with that small blade that was given to him, weirdly enough, that was a better use because not only did it save Puss's life, it wasn't solely used to defeat death, it, it was used to block his sickles until he got his sword back. And symbolic because it was a gift from Kitty. As even from behind the fire, Kitty still had Puss's back. In which he used both as a dual weapon before mirroring what death did to him at the start of their final fight. Pick it up. Pick it up. Pick it up. And I'd be fine if he just used his genius to solve his problem, because in the first film, that's how he does it. The start of the film shows him falling for some reason, and near the end, it's because, well, he will die from the height he's at. He has a dehydration gun while underneath a fountain. So what does he do? He dehydrates himself, grabs the fuse gun, and takes away Titan's power. Does he use technology? Yeah. Working technology, alongside a joke from earlier about warming up. When writing this, I realized why Megamind said that about Minion. Seriously, watch this film, it's fucking amazing. Oh, you've gotta be kidding me! Minion, if I live, I will kill you. Still warming up, sir. Come again? Warming up, sir. Warming up! The sun is warming up. And in the final fight with the Syndicate, the only clever part about it was him using his disguise watch on Nighty Knight, which peer pressure, dumb name, hypnotizes him. I take it back. They just copied it from the first film, from the opening of the first film. And how he defeats Doppler is with her own power and Behemoth with a truck. <laughs> Fantastic. What's that? Either a paperweight or a flash grenade. And do you know what sucks? That the voice actors they hired are really talented, but they don't fit the character they play. Megamind is played by Keith Ferguson, aka the voice of Blue, Reaper, Monkey, Flinhart Glomgold, Papa G, Bowl Boy. But Keith was the same actor for the games for Megamind, but it sounds like a different voice. Minion is played by Josh Brennan, who was Donatello, Mark Beaks, etc. And I think they're the closest voice actors to the original, but he just can't beat the original. But Fuck, do these voices for all the returning members do not fit in the slightest, which includes Roger Craig Smith as the mayor, Dr. Psycho Tony Hall, Lucy Hall is a roach and is the voice actor for Mercy. If I had a nickel for every show I review that had two voice actors from Overwatch, I'd have two nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice, right? And it's the fact that Will Ferrell had scheduling issues. And honestly, if he did read that script, I tried muddling my own schedule. And there's probably more I could go over, like how the mayor is randomly in the same office as the syndicate after being demoted, with like, no build up. I'll be honest, I had no idea he was the mayor until I looked at the scene again. Again, 30 years, 2 days. Villains in animation media can range from goofy to sinister, but overall they're classified as a villain with their motivations and acts along the way. For years we've had a different array of how we write villains, whether they make them more sympathetic or make them more borderline hateable. And usually they're matched with either unique, iconic, or cool designs. Crimson and Hell of the Boss looked near identical to the main cast member Moxie because that's his son. What differs him from Moxie is his design, anger, and what he's done and is doing as an abusive villain. Emperor Bellus is always meant to be manipulative, cold-hearted, and doesn't have a problem with killing the clones of his dead brother who he killed, while sacrificing anyone and everyone to achieve his goal, exterminating witches. Death from Puss in Boots is a balance between doing his job and doing it out of spite for someone who wasted multiple lives, making it a villainous act because he strives to take Puss's last life. But then you have a group of villains wanting the same objective, 
while also making them vastly different. But when you have a group of villains wanting the same objective while also making them vastly different, it should be moderately alright to do, right? Not for Mega Man 2. This entire team just sucks. Like, the Doom Syndicate is one of the worst group of villains I've seen yet in animation because it just sucks so much. I think one of the worst parts about adding more villains like this is just it erases the uniqueness to superpowered beings because Metro Man is an alien gifted with Superman's powers while Mega Man has its intellect. But then you just have these random array of superpowers and just it makes it so much more common. Since in the first film, Metro Man was celebrated. The, the dude got his own statue. He was like Jesus. The main drive I have with this is that they don't feel like they're in the same group because you have a lava monster, a weather girl, a mime, and a shadow knight? And that would be fine because in other medias, there's people with lanterns, monkeys, zombies, humans, banshees. The only character with a defined backstory in the film was Gale, Lady Doppler, who was a weather reporter who worked with Roxanne. That's their only connection, and they only ever bring that up about them. The rest are because mime. Monster. Night. One of their jokes is that they don't know who the leader is. Because you know this guy, right? The Knight? Well, his name is Fright Knight. Oh, oh, but sorry. Apparently his name change needs to be his only joke because his new name is Nighty Knight. Why? And then there's the other joke about him stealing a random teddy bear and... I can just tell the writers were either dead in their seat or cackling while slamming their hand on the table. Sitting on a rock. Gleb runs up to the bug. <laughs> <laughs> to cut in again while editing this, turns out that so-called teddy joke probably has more meaning in a backstory because there's an internal baby's cry when he sees the teddy bear. Now I doubt there was anything unique to it, but why do the writers just spring out this small detail and never bring attention to it ever again? Like, it's so clear looking at it again, his design is based around a nursery. Baby crying, childlike stars and moons along his armor, and his power is darkness. Like, clearly something happened to him as a baby which probably would have made him more sympathetic and possibly even offer a redemption arc just like Mega Mind, and this wasn't something that just sprung up halfway through the show. It was 30 minutes into the film. That's bad. There was a clear, purposeful, and creative decision to do this. At least when Hasman Hotel does this, they have a season 2 that will clear up and offer more depth to the characters, design choices, and lore to them. Here's a bit of advice DreamWorks when it comes to spawning a fandom. To get your money, you gotta get people talking about it. Once people are done talking about Mega Mind 2, that's it. I seriously hate this film the more I watch it. And like, Friday Night's design is the only cool one out of the bunch. And his powers with the animation look so, so bad. I mean, how do you make shadow powers look bad? They look cool when he forms them, and then it just looks like jelly. In The Last Wish, Death didn't have any noticeable powers. He does have them, but it's never explained because that only adds an extra layer of fear to him. Death is a concept in the Shrek universe we still don't have a full grasp on, and I hope we never do. Because it's even implied he could have killed Puss at any point. He's fast, strong, his whistle is a signature tactic to scaring Puss. I don't think he even made an appearance on the map while obviously being in the same place. The sequel showed an understanding that if we didn't know what Death could do, Puss wouldn't. And is he entirely serious? No. He treats hunting Puss as a game. He even has a few funny moments. But the villains in the syndicate? <laughs> that make me scoff. But you don't need a threatening villain in every story because you can still have villains who add humor. I brought up Vector in a previous video. Cause I mean, Look at Jack Horner! Jack is downright evil in the film from sacrificing his men to being so narcissistic he can't even see the life he has in comparison to most. And yet he has a lot of funny lines that add humour on top of his cold comedic charm. They're destroying a city and only two of the four were beaten by technology. There's just no depth to these characters. Peer pressure controls people or hypnotises them. I don't care. Lady Doppler shoots lightning. Wait. You couldn't have made her lightning themed. 
that that's like her only fucking power and you make it a general weather report? Behemoth is just a rock monster that shoots lava. Oh, and I haven't even talked about what the second film set up from what I had hoped was a throwaway line. Because apparently Megamind didn't learn all of his villainy through prison, prison inmates in his own attempt. No, 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 no. He apparently learnt it in a villain school where he killed his mentor. I only get this. Apparently he's alive, and I shit you not, they set up his character in the final part of the film just so he can be set up in the show. Machia villain is Megamind's mentor, and his entire purpose in the show is to be brought back to life. That's what the film set up, and half of the episodes in the show. And before I even show you what he looks like alive, this is what he looks like because what survived was only his brain, but not his brain. I doubt it would ever explain why. And this is him brought back. The brain design was cooler. It's clear his design is supposed to represent whatever decade the shot of had were cool. It's impossible to tell if he even had powers considering he uses Megamind as Binky. Which, by the way, Megamind hasn't had any use from since he was a teen. And honestly, I forgot he had it. And it was only brought to him because of Kaiko. Because she tried to prove to Megamind that she is worth being taught to be a hero after he wouldn't because he didn't actually kill Machia villain. Again, an aspect I don't think anyone would have cared about. But here's the best part. His only reason for existing is to become a symbol for Metro City and to make Megamind take the blame for it all. Making Megamind a villain again. Which, out of seven episodes, they never hinted they were going for that angle. And I think we're going to see more of it with season two, three, four. Hey, remember the dragon on in its story? I'd say more about these guys, but they run pretty dry in the entire film and show. Because the show, instead of focusing on these villains instead, episode one had Nighty Night, episode two had Dr. Donut, episode three had a cockroach voiced by Mercy, episode four was Lady Doppler, episode five was Kaiko's robot, Episode 6 was Behemoth, and then finally the last two episodes had all of them. It's pathetic, really. They never built up to it. They just had small scenes that built up to it while focusing on other garbage. Mark my words, Megamind. The Roaches will have their revenge. Oh, now he's got me doing it. <laughs> And to end this here, Filmer is known to be January 2023's worst animated adult show. Now, there are a lot of things to hate about the show, and thus so I made my own video about it. To summarise it, the show made fun of what it was based on. The characters and their dynamics had been altered so much they were all insufferable from start to end. Velma is a meta punchline that hates everything and everyone. Daphne is a drug dealing bad girl. Fred is a brain over body wuss. Literally. Norville is a simp and Scooby, oh sorry, Shaggy is dating Scoob. And Scoob was the operation name for a plot point in the show. And it's not just that, a lot of things in the series were copied from a more popular Scooby Doo show, Mystery Incorporated. Including the town name, the entire plot point about Daphne's adoptive parents loving her more than her birth parents, who used her to get crystal related treasure. That exact same thing that happened to Fred in Mystery Incorporated. And so much more. Farms to a military academy. And don't worry about Scooby. We found him a nice farm to live on. But in other words, besides some references here and there, it felt like they slapped the Scooby Doo brand on top of some random mystery show that they knew wouldn't have gotten popular. And as I've explained for this entire video, it feels like this is the same case with Megamind. Megamind doesn't feel like the same character and it feels like they erased everything that made the original IP. Because when you lay out the idea without Megamind, it's a character who was a villain turned hero that worked for a bigger villain group while his friend reinvents himself and others. And said hero wants to get popular because of the internet and has some iconic locations like desks in lab, donut shop, mayor office. Does any of that sound like Megamind? Parts, but not all. For the future, people should not do this when they have IPs. Seriously, imagine if they grabbed Spyro, made a TV show, and have him say a dozen internet references. It wouldn't be funny because they do it in the most meta way possible, or in Megamind's case, the most blatant way. Megamind 2 sucks. Balls. I'm grateful everyone and the search engine deems the Button of Doom a true sequel. Even if it's just a short, because it is. The Button of Dune used events from the first film by showing Megamind wouldn't know what to do as a hero. 
and that using villainous technology as a hero may be bad. But none of that is existent with Mega Mind 2. It just feels like Velma all over again has poorly designed and lazy villain designs. Stuffs a new character just to be the bridge between the internet and just... Oh, so much more I didn't even cover. If you want to check it out, just pirate it and review it poorly. Because I haven't seen a soul who actually likes Mega Mind 2 and its show. I'm not even sure if kids would like this shit because if Bluey is more mature than Mega Mind 2, then what the fuck DreamWorks. But if you do want to watch something, I do highly recommend watching Mega Mind 1, The Button of Doom, Puss in Boots 1, and The Last Wish. They are much better and The Last Wish has been DreamWorks' best film as of late, which is sad with all the potential all the other films have had after. Spirit out. Okay, right. What are the rules, fellas? Got me? What are the rules? Beat up your eyes!